welcome as he comes to share the word this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's good to be here. Salutation Saints. Again, those joining online, we uh, welcome you, but we miss you. And uh, to, this is to anyone here. If you are going through anything, if you need prayer support, if you need uh, to talk with a pastor, please reach out to us. Don't assume that we know what's going on in your life through what you posted last week on Facebook. Um, just please reach out to us. Uh, you know, my cell phone's 991-0984. Um, shoot me a text. I'd love to get to know you and just support you in any way that you can. And uh, we, we love you guys. And so let us help you, Pastor. Hey, many of you know um, this past week, my dad and I were able to take a lifelong dream trip of watching our favorite team, the New York Yankees, play in the World Series. Thank you. I know some people are clapping. I don't know if you're clapping for the Yankees, but I'll just assume you were. Um, <laughs> And here's a, a picture from that uh, trip. So his dad and I, and uh, it was an absolute uh, joy. We went to game three, and despite their loss, it was uh, a night to remember f for my life. It, it was just absolutely dream. And uh, people have asked me what it's like to travel with my dad. I'll just say, there's never a dull moment. He talks to everyone, and uh, even if they continue to ignore him on the subway, he continues to talk to them or at them. Uh, I felt like I was living in one of those progressive auto commercials. Yeah. Um, Tuesday, our flight didn't leave until 5.20 p.m. We showed up to the airport just in case four hours early. It took us seven minutes to get through security. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> That's the reality. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you because many of you uh, texted us and just wishing us a, a good time. And we could really feel and sense um, just your support. And I, and I appreciate that uh, to be able to do this lifelong dream father-son trip. Uh, it was a pure joy. And uh, thank you guys so much. Um, for I'll, I'll remember that a lifetime. Those who brought your Bible, turn to in your Bible to Acts chapter 23. For those who are confused right now why we applaud when uh, the Word of God is announced, it's because we believe that the Word of God is important and we get excited because it changes our lives. We are in the last week of our series of Fear Not. The title of my message today is Politics and Jesus. And in 2 Timothy verse 1, verse 7, or chapter 1, verse 7, says this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And that is my prayer this morning, that each of you would receive the spirit of God that would not give you a spirit of fear, but of sound mind, of, of love, of power. And, and that, that really is my heart that God would fill us with this peace, that everything is going to be okay, and that God is with you and that he's for you. And, and that is more than just a cliche saying. That's the reality in which we live, that he really is for us. He's for you, and he's with us. This coming Tuesday is a day that is going to come with big implications for our, our nation. And it could be easy to feel fearful but can I just remind you before we get started of some truths that are in Scripture? The first truth is that God establishes authorities. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Hear me, church. Whatever the result is on Tuesday... God will use it to bring people to him. Through blessings or through struggles, God can and will use all things for his glory. God establishes authorities. The second truth to, to, to be reminded of this morning is God will provide our every need. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus instructs us, be, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things, what you wear, what you eat, your needs, everything will be given to you as well. If economic collapse comes, which 
the way I see it, and this is just the way I see it, but the way that our nation is spending and the history patterns of other nations, I should probably say when economic collapse comes, God will provide. It's who he is. It's what he does. Place your trust in God. And I will say this, I honestly believe that people who tithe are, are, have less anxiety and less worry about the financial futures because a tithe shows the devil and proves to the Lord that your trust is in him. Come what may, my faith will stand because God will provide. He's going to provide for you. Take a deep breath and know that it's gonna be okay. The third thing I just wanna remind you is we will have trouble. John 16, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me, in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. As the landscape of life changes, we need to change our mindset and our prayers from, Lord, please protect me and protect my family from all harm to, Lord, I thank you that you are going to see me and my family through. I thank you that you were and are faithful, and I'm going to stand on the victory that has already been won, and I believe that you're going to see me through it. Zach preached a message last week about the Lord walking us through the valley. You can guarantee you that when this nation faces dark times, when you as an individual face dark times, God is with you and there is going to be trouble but God is with us and that's the last thing that I want to remind you is that God is with you Matthew 28 19 and 20 uh, verses 19 and 20 Jesus told his disciples these are his last words before ascending back to heaven he says go and make disciples you guys know this this is a missions giving church but but go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, what does he say? I am with you always to the very end of the age. As we live in the center of the will of God our Father, there he is. When we do what God has asked us to do, which is what? Reaching lost people neighbors, coworkers, friends, family members, when we are doing that, God is with us. We don't have to be afraid in the valley. We don't have to be afraid of tomorrow because God is a God, Emmanuel, God with us. There's no need to worry or fear. Those are just a few truths that should be on the forefront of our minds so that whatever happens on Tuesday or in the months to follow, we can say in our heart, it is well. Now, if you've been in your Bible to Acts chapter 23 this whole time, just go ahead and pat yourself on the back. That was my first sermon. Here's the real sermon. (laughs) The book of Acts uh, is also known as the Acts of the Apostles. As a kid, I always grew up and I was like, the book of Acts, like, oh, sweet, let's chop something down, you know. Um, Different Acts, Acts, A-C-T-S, it's spelled different. And it records how Jesus continued his mission on earth to seek and save people who are spiritually lost, but not by his own hands and his words, but rather through empowering people to say and do powerful acts. And the book of Acts is one of my favorites because I believe it shows us great insight of how the early church functioned and how we should model church and do things today. To bring you up to speed, there is a man named Saul and he was a devout Jew. He, he viewed anyone who followed Jesus as a threat to Judaism, and he persecuted the early believers. But then he has this radical encounter with Jesus on a road headed to Damascus, which Damascus is north and east of physical Israel, about 70 kilometers or miles. I don't remember, 70-something and uh, he has this encounter with Jesus, and in that moment, he, he realizes that Jesus really was the Messiah, which means the Savior of the world. And so Saul changes his name to Paul, and he becomes the leading voice of early of the early Christian church. He, he goes from persecuting Christians to leading the charge of the Christians. And he's, he's spending time uh, doing these missionary um, 
uh, journeys, and, and, and he's been going to places including Athens, Macedonia, Greece, and to Ephesus telling everyone about salvation in Jesus. And a few chapters earlier, I know this is long, but this is important. A few chapters earlier, Acts chapter 20, in verse 22, Paul is in Ephesus, and he says this farewell to the Ephesians, and he says this in verse 22. You can just follow along on the screen. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Even though Paul knew that he was going to be persecuted and things were going to get tough, he went forward. People of faith are not people of fear. They move forward. They advance the kingdom of God. Even though they know that there's going to be difficult times, they push forward. And so he arrives in Jerusalem and he begins trying to reach his old friends who are now his adversaries. And they hate him. And they throw him in prison and they demand him to be punished by the Romans as for being a threat to Rome. But because Paul is a Roman citizen, he, he, he demands for a trial. He says, you can't condemn me until I have a trial. And so now there's this plot for his life, and that brings us to our text today. I'm going to ask you to stand as we read. And uh, the only people this morning that have an excuse for sleeping during my sermon are people who are in Poland, okay? So you get a pass. Everybody else, you got an extra hour. How many actually took advantage of that hour? I I feel great. It's, It's like 10, 13 in my mind. I feel awesome. Acts chapter 23, let's read starting in verse 12. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath to not eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard this plot, which I don't know why they didn't say when, when Paul's nephew heard this, right? Um, he went into the barracks and told Paul. And then Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell them. So he took him to the commander and the centurion said, Paul, the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. And the commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and said, what is it you want to tell me? Verse 20, Paul's nephew says this. Some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow. Now, the Sanhedrin were the religious court. It was a a group of 72 Jews who oversaw the law and kind of preserved Judaism, right? They they were kind of the leaders of the Jews. And so if you're wondering what the Sanhedrin is, I I had to learn that um, at at some point. So I want to make sure everybody knows who we're talking about. Bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Verse 21, don't give in to them because there are more than 40 of them waiting to in an ambush for him. They have taken an oath to not eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now waiting for your consent to their request. And the commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to the governor Felix. Hear me. In the same way that Paul advanced the kingdom of God in the midst of persecution and suffering, the call of today's sermon is that we as a church, we as God's chosen mouthpiece for this time, for such a time as this, that we would advance the gospel and the kingdom of hope even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of uncertainty, that we would not be a people of fear, but we would be filled with the faith of Jesus Christ and the hope of his salvation and that we would move forward. That's the call tonight. Let's pray. This morning, let's pray. 
God, I thank you for everyone here, and I pray this morning that you would equip me and that you would speak exactly what you need for us to hear. Open up my heart to more of you. Open up my mind to understand more, God. Would you speak this morning to our hearts? I pray for anyone that is dealing with anxiety, God, that a peace would surpass all understanding, and in this moment, heart rate would go down. There would be a calmness that we would know what it is to rest in your presence under the shadow of your wings, for you are with us. We love you, Lord. Speak through me. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated unless you want to stand. If that helps you stay awake, that's fine. No. (laughs) Acts chapter 23 uh, was not in the plans for this Fear Not series, but last week I read this passage uh, during a, a personal time of devotion, and I, I just kind of was reading through it, and I'm like, Lord, why is this in the Bible? This just feels like story time with Paul, right? Like, what's the significance of this? Why, why is this here? Help me understand, which is a prayer that I believe the Lord always answers. And the Lord pointed out some truths about the nature of his character and drew some parallels that encouraged me. And I want to share those with you this morning. And it's my prayer that you also would be encouraged. The Lord revealed to me the irony of this text that we just read. The Jews felt as if they were under oppression from the Romans, which they were. Their idea, though, of a savior was someone who was going to free them from the political oppression taking place. Jews viewed Rome as their enemy. But the Jewish leaders were attempting to use Rome to do their dirty work, just like they had done with Jesus. It was the Jews who used their enemy to carry out their plot against Jesus. Here's the irony. The same Jews who hated the Romans were attempting to use the Romans to protect and to preserve what their agenda, but in the end, God used the Romans to preserve the gospel and advance his kingdom. I'll say that again. The same Jews who hated the Romans were attempting to use the Romans to protect and promote their agenda, but in the end, it was actually God who uses the Romans to preserve the gospel and advance his kingdom. The Jews had their perspective wrong. At this point in time, they were so focused on the political pain that was being caused by Rome that that they were not seeing things clearly. Their enemy was never Rome. It was Satan. And in the same way today, it is so important that we remain focused and see things clearly. Our enemy is not government, it's Satan. Satan uses people in all places to accomplish his mission, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he uses people in schools, In government, in the workplace, even in churches, Satan is at work. And and what Satan wants uh, is for us to view the people that he has influence over as the enemy and not identify him as being the enemy. He wants us to hate a person rather than hating him. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have known someone who struggled with a substance addiction? Right, whether that be alcohol or drugs or something of that. M- most of us have been affected by that in some way. And I've walked with many people who have gone through the process of forgiving or navigating a person's addiction. And, and one of the most difficult things to do when, when you're dealing with an individual who is struggling with an addiction is to separate the individual from the substance. Oftentimes, the individual outside of the control and the influence from the substance is a really great person. And it's really difficult to see that person as who they are because it's the alcohol talking or it's the drug speaking. How many understand what I'm what I'm saying? And and you can you can understand that, right? Why is it so hard to remember that when it comes to people who make ungodly decisions or even promote 
ungodly behavior, that they are under the influence of Satan and his powers. I I want you to hear this. They were created in God's image, and they were created to do good works. But unfortunately, they are being influenced by Satan to accomplish his plans rather than God's plans. All people were created by God and for God. And we must love them and remember that we're called to lead them back to their creator, to lead them back to Jesus. If you have hate in your heart towards a certain group of people or a political party, you have misidentified your enemy and Satan has crept into your heart and he's using you to accomplish his mission and his plan. For how can you ever share the gospel and love to Jesus to someone that you hate? We must pray for people who oppose God. Lord, help us love those people. Help us love the people that are promoting an ungodly agenda. Help me have compassion for them. Help me, help me see a person and an individual who is lost who is apart from their heavenly father. Give us compassionate eyes to see people and not be deceived into thinking that that they are the problem, but that Satan is the one that has control in their life. God, would you break chains in their lives? Help us, Lord, to stay focused. Our enemy is not government, Satan is. But our hope is not government, Jesus is. Let me make some clarifying statements so that no one mishears or hears something that I'm not saying. This is what I'm not saying. I am not saying that government is unimportant. Government matters. Our elected officials and our leaders and our politicians, they matter. Legislation matters. And I hope that everyone takes time to pray and vote because you have a voice, and that voice was purchased by the, the bloodshed of many uh, Americans that have gone before us. And, and so I, I pray that we all vote. And after we vote, we need to trust God with the results. Let me clarify what trusting God means. Trusting God is not passivity. Trusting God is not just being inactive. Trusting God is hearing what he tells you to do obeying what he tells you to do, and then being okay with how things turn out in the end. That's trusting God. Trusting God starts with obedience. Trusting God starts with action, and then it's the release of saying, hey, come what may, I'm gonna be okay. God is with me. Our hope is not in presidents, policies, or legislation. Our hope is in Jesus. How many know that if you have house rules, right? Parents in the room, right? You got house rules. That just because you've got a rule in your house, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to abide by those. Any parents had a rebellious child, children? Uh, I'm seeing like, uh, you know. Any self-admitted rebellious children, you know, in the room and stuff? One person real eager to raise their hand like, yeah, that's me, Right? And there were things that I knew I shouldn't do that I did growing up. You cannot legislate a heart. Legislation and laws can change, but if a heart remains unchanged, there's still a larger issue at hand. Hear me. God's plan to improve this world by advancing his kingdom of heaven is through relational ministry It's not through government. I'm not sure that the Jewish leaders ever placed their hope in government, but it is very interesting how they attempted to use government to try and preserve and protect what they believed to be God's ways. Many Christians, I believe, attempt to do the same thing today. If we get the right person in office, the world's going to be a better place. In other words, essentially saying, let's use government to fix our spiritual problems. Can I just remind you of a statistic that Pastor Jeff shared a few weeks ago about the percentage of Americans who hold a biblical worldview? 4%. 4%. That's less than 1 in 20 people hold and adhere to this book, to the Bible. I I don't want to be a Debbie Downer 
But I don't see our nation ever electing Christian government and a cabinet and senators and representatives that will change laws. And even if we did, 19 out of 20 people would likely rebel against any law put into place to legislate their behavior. Human trafficking is against the law. It's a horrible thing. Yet right now, human trafficking is one of the biggest problems that we're facing in America. And it's happening at a greater pace than ever before. There are many illegal drugs, yet we still have a, a, a drug problem and an opiate problem and, and all these different things, right? When I was in New York City this past week, I was just reminded how sinful America is as I walked down Times Square. I just saw so much darkness and my heart was just so unsettled. I, I just felt so disturbed and, and not disturbed in like, ew, gross, a disturbed as in like, oh my God. Oh my goodness, how, how have we gotten this far? And, and I don't believe that evil and darkness is just reserved for the big cities anymore. I, I, Elizabeth and I have noticed in recent years just the increased amount of decorations that come out during Halloween. And I'm not talking about pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns and scarecrows. I'm talking about demonic images, dead bodies, Different things that are on people's lawn that what? They promote death. They, they promote darkness. They, they promote the, the absolute opposite of, of what God is. And here's the truth. The church has failed at spreading the light of Jesus. And we are all guilty in allowing darkness to prevail. And we need to step up and step out to share the light in the life of Jesus. It's not a politician or lawmaker's job to point people to Jesus. It's your job. It's my job. It's our job. That's why we do events like light the night I had many conversations with people that don't come into church that only come and my prayer is that they felt the love of Jesus they walked in and they said wow I've never experienced peace like this wow those people were happy wow those people loved my children wow I could use some people to support me in what I'm going through the church as a whole meaning both pastors and congregants the church have cowered away from preaching the full gospel in fear of offending people, and the result is a society that does not fear God nor know his ways. And what's even worse is that there is many people who attend church and would consider themselves a Christian who do not fear God nor truly know his ways. We are called to be in the world, not of the world. And now is not the time to be a shelter in place, to preserve our righteousness, to protect our godliness and protect ourselves from the enemy. Now is the time to advance the kingdom of God and to reclaim what rightfully belongs to the Lord. Now is the time to push back the forces of evil through times of praying, through times of fasting, through testifying of what the Lord has done in your life and witnessing to our neighbors and to our friends. Jesus is our hope. And in the same way that Satan uses people to accomplish his mission, mission to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus uses people to accomplish his mission to restore life, to breathe hope, and bring people to him. And guess what? You each have been called according to his purpose and his plans to be an advocate for the kingdom of God. It is time that the church gets off their butts and gets out into the world to preach the gospel. It is time that we no longer expect Rome to fix our issues, but to realize that the solution starts with us. And I'm not just yelling at you, I'm yelling to me. I've got neighbors that I've lived next to for 10 and a half years, and it's been slow, but I need to be more aggressive in telling them about the hope in Jesus Christ, because God is coming back someday. And I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, look at all these people that were in your influence. What have you done? Our hope is not politics. Our hope is in Jesus. Right now is the perfect day and age to point people to Jesus. People are afraid. But people of faith have peace. Why? It's Jesus. The hope of Jesus. My last point is this, is that God uses all things 
to advance his kingdom. I see Satan using politics to create division and fear. I see Satan using government to promote ungodly ideas and laws. But that doesn't scare me. Why? Because God uses all things to advance his kingdom. Even politics, politicians, and government. Answer this, true or false. Satan uses people to promote his kingdom of darkness. True. True or false. God uses people to promote his kingdom of light. True or false. The same person can be used by both Satan and by God simultaneously to promote their kingdoms. I'd say true. Now stick with me here. I was reminded in the time of study of the high priest of Jesus' day, Caiaphas. He was deceived, religious, and corrupt in many ways. He thought he was doing right by God, but he wasn't. John the Baptist called him and the other Pharisees a brood of vipers, which meant that they were sinful and unrepentant. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs, which essentially means that they looked all pretty on the outside like a white tomb, but on the inside it was full of moral decay and and sinfulness, and they were dead and full of hypocrisy. Satan used Caiaphas by promoting legalism, which tainted God's plan for his people. Satan used Caiaphas by placing a hate and fear in his heart towards Jesus. In John chapter 18, verse 14 says that Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Satan thought he was using Caiaphas to stomp out Jesus, but God God was using Caiaphas to fulfill the prophecies about the Messiah. God was using Caiaphas to fulfill the prophecies found in Isaiah 53 or Isaiah 49. And if maybe not for Caiaphas, Jesus wouldn't have suffered at the hands of the Romans. Caiaphas was deceived. He was corrupt individual, yet God used his actions to fulfill his plans. Throughout the history of God's covenant to his people, we have seen God use both godly leaders and ungodly leaders to draw people close to him. Israel would go in these cycles where they would trust fully in the Lord and they would live under his blessing and they would live under his attention and good things would begin to happen, but then soon they would begin to trust in their own power. Soon they would get, begin to trust in their, and rely on their own strength and their own wealth. And then God would remove his hand or he would send in a judge or a king or a neighboring nation to, to, to bring about judgment. And things would get bad and it would cause Israel to repent and turn back to God. We see it all throughout scripture. Just read the book of Judges. It's this constant turnover, this constant cycle. And how many times in our own lives has that been our case? I'm so on fire, I'm so on fire, I just kind of get distracted, I... I slowly slip off the train. Oh, God, I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Oh, there you are, God. Everything's so good. Everything's awesome. Oh, man, this looks pretty good. And and we just go in these cycles. Could God be using the government to turn people's hearts towards him? Earthly judgment is allowed to get people to repent so that mercy can be shown. While we might feel like darkness is prevailing, could it actually be God's grace by allowing people to suffer where they might turn to him? What stinks is that the righteous have to suffer with the unrighteous. But there are people that I pray for that I love so much and they're apart from God and if I knew that a little bit of persecution or a lot of persecution was headed my way or financial collapse and financial instability instability, and, and if I, I knew that, that uh, uh, the comfortable life that I live was gone but I knew that the people that I pray for would turn to Jesus how to welcome that all day long because this life is like a vapor. And I know that that is your heart too. We don't need to be fearful. 
This life is so temporary. Suffering, pain, it's so short. But heaven is forever. We see Jesus being the perfect example of suffering for the souls of others. He suffered and died a horrible death on the cross so that others would be saved. Let's be more like Jesus. If the world continues to get more and more miserable, let's suffer with purpose and lead people to the hope found in Jesus Christ. Let's relationally lead our friends and our neighbors. Let's be like Paul, who I read this earlier in Acts chapter 20. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. We do not need to be a people of fear. We need to be a people of faith. And it's time that we pray. It's time that we intercede. Let's take spiritual ground. We are in a spiritual war. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and and, and the kingdom of darkness. And it is time that we return to our knees. It's time that we return to, to petitioning for the souls of our loved ones, our families, our marriages, Let's make Jesus the center of our lives. Would you stand and close your eyes this morning? Musicians, would you come? And I'm gonna ask that we stay here. We've got time if you, in just a moment, we're gonna sing a song and I hope that you'll personalize it by really meaning the words in your heart. But before we sing, just with every eye closed and head bowed, I wanna give opportunity for anyone feeling anxious about tomorrow. It might be politically related or maybe there's just something else. I wanna wanna pray a prayer and would you just join in your heart with me and would you just agree as, as we pray right before we sing the song. Lord, our hope is in you. Help us, God, to remain focused on you. Empower us as your people. Help us reach our loved ones. We know that the time is short, God. Help help us, Jesus, to set our eyes and our affection on things above. God, come what may, let our faith stand that we would say that it is well with our soul. Help us, God, to be people of faith and not of fear. I pray, God, that that you would lead us as we vote and we do our responsibilities here on earth. But, Lord, we trust you with tomorrow. There is enough worry about tomorrow, and so, God, we just give it to you. We, we, We pray for our leaders right now. We pray for our elected leaders. I pray, Jesus, that you would put into office godly people. But, Lord, more than that, would you open up our eyes that we would be the kingdom of light. God, would you help me reach my neighbors? Would you help me reach my family members? Would you, would you help me reach my, my childhood best friend, God? Help me, God, to stay focused on you, eyes on you, Jesus at the center of it all. God, may we not become distracted or deceived, but may we become more intentional with giving you back the time and the breath that you have already given us. So I pray this morning that if there's anyone that is carrying anxiety or fear, I pray that they would lay it down at the foot of the cross and they would leave it there. I pray that your peace that surpasses any understanding that can be conceived here on this side of heaven, that would just sweep over their minds, sweep over their hearts, that God is with us, that he will provide, that that you are in control and is even as dark as things uh, seem, God, that, that we trust you. And so this morning, we say, we trust you. We trust you with our hearts. We trust you with salvation. We trust you with this nation. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my marriage. I trust you in every situation. I pray that your light would shine, that people would experience the kingdom of heaven. And this morning, my prayer is that everyone will put Jesus at the center 